microfinance for catalyzing climate adaptation impacts at scale. Is the sound okay now? Is that Thank you. Okay. My name is Jason Spensley. I'm the, C I'm the Senior Climate Change Specialist at the Global Environment Facility where I work on strategies for private sector engagement in climate adaptation. And I have the pleasure to moderate this session this morning. I'd like to highlight that this is the first session of many in a series of sessions over these two weeks here in the GCF Jeff Pavilion. Thank you for joining us, those who are in the room. We're also webcasting live this session, and we understand we have great uh, participation from, um, from individuals on the web. This session will also be stay, will stay on, the, on this uh, pavilion website um, into the future so people can access it. We're really excited about this session because we at the Global Environment Facility see microfinance, and specifically green and inclusive microfinance, as a very powerful strategy for localized climate adaptation impact at scale. It's also important to highlight that this is a key element in the Jeff's climate adaptation strategy for the next four years. We're really fortunate to have with us uh, a, a very insightful panel of a range of actors across the microfinance ecosystem. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the panel and, and I'd, I'd like to start by introducing each of the panelists and then we'll go, we'll move to an active discussion. First, Luca Torre is founder and co-CEO of Gawa Capital, an investment fund manager targeting social and environmental impacts, including with a, co with a, with a keen focus on green microfinance. Is it possible to adjust the, the sound? Test, test. No. Could you maybe give that to uh, Olivier? Could you take this microphone and turn it off? Okay, I hope this will work better sound wise. Okay, where are the guinea pigs? We're the first uh, Jeff session, so we're working out kinks. Can everybody please make sure the microphone is off? So, Luca Torre, welcome. I think that's worked out. We still have sound issues. I will continue. Laurence Pesse, thank you for being with us. Laurence is head of corporate social responsibility at BNP Paribas. As you may know, BNP Paribas is a leader and a champion of inclusive finance. Jenny Ryu is senior climate change specialist at IFAD, vous êtes très bienvenue. IFAD is a Jeff agency that's very active on a growing set of climate adaptation projects with the microfinance strategy. Unfortunately, Kunal Prasad, CEO of Cropin, uh, could not join us at the last minute due to a visa issues. Cropin is a South Asia-based provider of climate and agricultural data for farmer decision making. And uh, finally, uh, closest to me, Christoph Jungfleisch is co-initiator of the Scale for Resilience initiative here at COP27. He's also founder and managing director of Yapu Solutions, a promoter of resilience finance. So, as we move into the, uh, into the panel and, and to the speakers, I'd like to invite you please to consider three powerful potentials of green adaptation-oriented microfinance for localized climate adaptation impact at scale. First, the potential to provide much needed capital to vulnerable smallholder farmers and MSMEs at accessible terms, and this is an important point we'll be touching on, to transition to more climate resilient practices. Second, the potential to use scarce public finance, including public finance through multilateral funds like the Jeff, to de-risk and therefore catalyze much larger scale private capital for climate action. And we have a couple of key partners who have a lot of insight and expertise in this area. And third, to potentially, the power to potentially systematically measure and track climate adaptation impacts from investment made through 
the monitoring systems and the, and the credit decision-making systems of our microfinance partners. Three potential powerful impacts uh, of, of working through microfinance. Now, over to our speakers. We're going to start with Christoph Jungfleisch, who has agreed to share with us a short overview of the what. What is microfinance? What is green microfinance? What is adaptation-oriented green microfinance? Who are the type of actors involved and how does it work? Christoph will provide a very short presentation, a few slides. It's the only presentation in the session. And then we'll go into a panel on the how, if you will, to make it happen. Thank you, Christoph. Hi. I will need this one, I think. Yes. I'm Christoph, um, and I'm speaking on behalf of... Hi, again. I'm Christoph. I'm speaking on behalf of Escape for Resilience. Um, I'm CEO and founder of Yapo Solutions. Um, about one and a half years back, we founded together with GABA Capital and CIAT, CCAF's um, Escape for Resilience. What we are targeting is building resilience for the most vulnerable. So what are we talking about? Well, we have a couple of concrete and ambitious objectives. Um, so by 2030, we want to finance 3 million smallholder farming households and rural households um, with over 5 billion US dollars to invest proactively in their resilience. And um, now I will present a bit what do we mean when we are talking about green microfinance? What does it actually mean for the, the, the field of adaptation and resilience finance? Because it's a bit more complex even. So what is microfinance in general terms? Um, it's all types of financial services and products. Yeah? So think of your house bank where you're going. Usually well-developed microfinance institutions, uh, they provide the same services. Yeah? But to customers that are usually very informal and excluded from the formal financial systems. So they try to get access and they probably have access community-based access or loan shark-based access to the same um, offers, but they don't have access to formal financial institutions. We are talking about very low transaction amounts, and in order to make it um, actually sustainable, financially sustainable, we need to scale it up. So you, le you need a lot of these retail finance um, operations in order to make it happen. So, um, but very important, especially for those working at international organizations, it's not grants. It's commercial finance. Yeah? There are very well-developed um, business models around it. And as of today, we have approximately 200 billion US dollars in assets worldwide. And we have over 10,000 um, uh, service providers, financial service providers. So what is a green microfinance? Um, it's honestly still a blurry and fuzzy concept um, as of today. Of course, we have very clear investment targets. Um, Generally, it's targeting uh, environmentally sustainable investments. Good. Mitigation, adaptation, circular economy, blue economy, biodiversity conservation. It's a mix. Yeah, it depends on the country, it depends on the institution, depends on the existing regulation. What are the key challenges? Well, first of all, financial service providers' capacity to do so. Um, second, we don't have global standards. That's why it's still quite blurry, quite fuzzy um, what it actually means. We, don't, we, we are not speaking a common language. Um, and then we need traceability and transparency. So we need to be absolutely sure that the money that we are channeling into green finance or adaptation finance, that it's actually having a positive environmental or adaptation or resilience impact. And for that we need funding. Yeah? I think in the first steps, yes, concessional funding will be needed. And we will look at the last slide, it's focusing on that. So who are we talking about in terms of financial service providers? Well, of course, banks, cooperatives, NGOs that are focusing on providing specifically loans, but also saving, uh, saving products and insurances. Um, that's partly regulated, partly non-regulated um, sectors. Yeah? So you have a mix. Um, you have then value chain actors, so um, input providers in the act value chains, uh, for example, and off-takers yeah? that can finance predominantly working capital. Yeah? And you have a growing number of fintechs, um, such as ourselves, such as Cropin, which is not here, um, unfortunately, and that are financing. And usually, the nice part on that is it's 100% based on software. So I have a complete view on the data. That's not the solution to everything, but it's a good step in the right direction. 
So yeah, no, only one. Who are the customers and beneficiaries? So we are really looking at the most vulnerable. So they depend on climate and ecosystem services. Yeah, it's um, they depend on the rain for their agricultural production. Yeah, they depend on um, forests uh, to maintain the hill um, and avoid landslides. Yeah, they have limited access to formal um, service system, service ecosystems in general. So for capacity building, for anything around climate solutions, adaptation solutions, finance, but also information. And it's very important that you foster these face-to-face, trust-based, often community-focused uh, relationships. So what they don't see, they don't believe usually. Yeah? So you need to have your foot in the community. Um, how it is usually working, green microfinance, and that's the same um, flow of funds um, for um, adaptation or resilience finance. Well, the investors choose where they want to invest, yeah, the characteristics. Well, I only want to do ecosystem-based adaptation. I only want to do nature-based solutions. Yeah, well, we can select that. The financial service providers um, ensure traceability, transparency, and efficiency in laying out these funds. Um, and checking on each on the transactions. And the most vulnerable gain access to competitive funding. And best practice as of today is usually that I can manage risk quite well if I put something more than just the funding. So for example, information services, capacity building services. So a loan comes automatically with two, three sessions um, of technical assistance in order to enhance production, in order to enhance resilience. So now, now switching to the adaptation and resilience part. It is only adaptation and resilience if it addresses concrete risks. Yeah? And, and this is the, the great distinction between green microfinance, which can have several dimensions of positive environmental impact, and adaptation or resilience finance. It needs to address specific climate threats, climate sensitivities. So we start with the exposure, which is basically depending on your location. Yeah? We can have beautiful risk maps. We match them with the GPS location. And I know, as far as I can know, uh, on a probabilistic basis, I know what the main climate threats in this location are. I know, once I learned it from the customer, I know what is the economic activity. It's an agricultural production. It's a small shop. I can, we have catalogs, for example, at Yapu and others have too. Um, where we can say, well, the sensitivity against specific climate threats is this, 68.3, yeah? And then we have the adaptive capacity, which needs to be built upon taxonomies. So we need catalogs, which give us a conceptual framework in order to understand what is a resilience investment, adaptation investment, what not. So now here I have a bit more text, um, uh, just, just that we know what we are talking about when we are talking about um, uh, taxonomies. We have objectives. This is our internal working definition. So we have four objectives. Increase climate resilience, nature resilience, health resilience, and economic or socioeconomic resilience. And resilience investment is only a resilience investment if it at least supports one of these dimensions, doesn't harm any other, maintains basic safeguards like human rights or, or prohibition of child labor, and complies with a set of technical verification criteria. So for each investment, you need to verify if it complies with certain criteria in order to say, yes, that's an adaptation or resilience investment. Co-benefits and only co-benefits are any mitigation related topics. Yeah? So we cannot expect the most vulnerable to invest in common goods based on an individual risk. Yeah? Paying, them paying for uh, supporting the common goods. Yeah? There needs to be an economic link to their personal day-to-day -day life. So we classify, we verify, and then we assess the contribution. Um, second challenge was the capacity of financial service providers. Um, we are working with this, the path to resilience. 95% of financial um, sectors, at least microfinance, but even I think in many more developed uh, financial sectors are in a mere reaction dimension. So they learn about the climate risks once the, loan are, the loans are in arrears. That's when they say, oh yeah, there was a drought, shoot. And now we need to figure out how we solve it. We could have known five months ago 
that there will be problems in the loan portfolio. So this is, this is the common ground where everybody is. First step is disclosure of environmental risks in the first step, gross climate risk, net climate risk um, uh, as a last step in this dimension. And then we get where it gets really interesting. We get into the promotion of resilience, the promotion of adaptation. We have four stages defined there, and the final stage is really a complete alignment with national climate strategies, with national adaptation plans, with national taxonomies. Um, yes, this, that's an example from us, of course. Gather the, the data digitally, process it automatically, and start learning. Um, of course, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, um, those are the buzzwords here. Um, Everybody is working with this in that space, um, and that's clearly the goal, so that we can manage massive data to learn what actually does work for different economic value chains under different microclimates, what does work and what does not. What are the economics behind it? How can we channel funds in order to promote the adaptation or resilience solutions which have the most and best impact? So, what can Jeff and GCF do? <laughs> so, of course, um, de-risk funding. I think um, both financial institutions with different risk appetites and different financial um, structures available, um, de-risking will be one of the key topics um, I think everybody knows. No? Build the capacity of financial service providers. Yeah? So, um, not all institutions can do it, but the operational solutions are out there. So, um, and not only by us, not only by the Scale for Resilience or Yapu. Um, there are different and other fintechs that are supporting financial service providers. And help to create markets, markets for adaptation and resilience solutions. This is usually, we, we, we are working um, with a lot of financial institutions, over 20 institutions. Um, they are deploying their own funds for adaptation, but we don't always have the market uh, solutions at hand. So the drip irrigation system, the water reservoir, the solar pump, the solar panel yeah, also increases resilience, by the way. So what we need are public-private partnerships. SDG 17, it's my favorite SDG, yeah? Alliance for the Golds. Um, but honestly, public-private is not really where it could be, let's say. Yeah? So we need disruptive or radical collaboration. So my invitation would be, Jeff and GCF, please get closer to the private financial sector. I think we have a perfect uh, panel for that, and thank you for that space. Back to you. Thank, thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you. I, it was really important to take the time, because if I can say so, if I can be very frank, microfinance, green, uh, resilience microfinance is pretty new as a major significant purposeful strategy for multilateral public climate finance and, and in particular for the Jeff. So understanding this, understanding the subtleties, the opportunities, the ecosystem of actors is really crucial as we're moving into this space where other actors have been leading uh, for, for many years. There's a long trajectory. A key message I took, Christoph, from this is the potential for very localized impact based on science, based on climate data, at scale, at, a, at the scale that we urgently need, together with key partners like Gawa Capital, like BNP Paribas, and others. Um, and that's why we're so glad that we're here today. So now we're going to move to the panel. We're going to have a discussion format, uh, questions, answers, free-flowing. And then we'll have, please, um, dis uh, questions um, from the audience. Please uh, join us as you're available. Thanks, Christophe. Um, so we're going to, to shift uh, to yourself, um, Luca Torre. Luca Torre, you manage Gawa Capital, a large-scale fina commercial financial investor, a, a financial fund that's investing in microfinance. Luca, we would like your advice, if I can be frank. How can we best, as a public multilateral finance institution, use our limited funds that ultimately comes from taxpayer dollars to catalyze much larger scale investment for localized adaptation and resilience of the most vulnerable, of smallholder farmers, micro, small, and medium enterprises. How can we best blend our strengths together for adaptation impact? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, this is a fascinating topic, uh, uh, and at Gawa Capital, we have been put a lot of thinking uh, uh, b behind this. 
let, let me start by saying that microfinance is a bit at the junction point uh, because uh, we have, as an industry which is very really old, I mean, it's been, this is uh, Mohamed Yumunus uh, started back in the, in the 90s and has developed, as Christoph mentioned, uh, very nicely. Now it's more than, uh, uh, you know, it's covering uh, it's, it's 200 million uh, uh, clients, lots of providers, etc. But so far, the microfinance industry has been focusing primarily on providing access to financial services. So is it just about providing an access? So if you are a low-income person in almost any country uh, in the world, maybe in Africa still we're not there yet, but you can get a loan at this point because the industry has really grown uh, really substantially. Now what we need to start doing is pushing microfinance industry not only to providing access, but to provide products that really meet people's needs. And a huge need we have right now, it's the one of helping vulnerable communities to adapt to climate change. Now, this, this requires microfinance institutions, uh, as uh, uh, Christo was mentioning before, to change their operations, uh, to launch new products, uh, to adapt the risk management system. All that requires subsidies. All that requires uh, catalytic capital. That kind of change, whenever there is a change, a difference, uh, um, private investors uh, to invest in change might perceive a higher amount of risk and as a result, uh, might require catalytic capital to take that risk at scale. Um, to give you a concrete example, uh, uh, we uh, um, uh, we launched in, in uh, we, well, we're launching next year, but we, we did the same. This is the same structure we already did in 2019. We're launching next year a 300 million uh, euro fund, which is doing exactly that. Is going to invest in microfinance institution, trying to push them to get into resilience. Uh, changing the way they're operating. And in order to raise these 300 million uh, uh, euros, we will get uh, 35 million euros of first loss. So basically, if the fund will lose some money, uh, a, a development financial institution, in this case, uh, um, uh, it will be the European Commission and another large DSI, DFI, we're working with the, with the GCF specifically uh, on that, they will lose the first tranche, and then, and then, and then, if they all on the other side, if there is returns to, make, to be made, everybody, the first loss as well as the private investors will make the return. But this is a great way to really attract private capital. But then, what the development financial institutions can do as well, which is extremely important, they will be providing us a, a grant to finance technical assistance. Again, to transform financial institutions investments are not enough, are necessary, because then uh, with those investments, the financial institutions, the microfinance institution needs to use them to build a portfolio, but they also need grants uh, to transfer knowledge so that they can uh, receive, you know, get consultants that can teach them and help them to launch a new climate adaptation uh, line. So. There is really a huge uh, role. And I would add, um, you mentioned this at the beginning, uh, another important role that uh, the that, that development finance institution can play is, uh, you mentioned, and if you want, we can talk about it later, I don't want to anticipate myself, but is affordability. Affordability is key. If we want this to work, not only we need to be sure that the microfinance institution has the right incentive to adapt, take the risk, and launch a new uh, climate adaptation uh, kind of new product, but we also need to be sure that the clients, uh, the vulnerable community, have the right incentives uh, to actually adopt and actually go and buy a water pump, go and, 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 and buy a, green, a, a, a greenhouse uh, uh, and, and protect their crops. To do that, sometimes, and I've seen this on the ground, we might need to provide loans, so the microfinance institution need to provide loans uh, potentially lower interest rate and uh, that lower interest rate need to somehow subsidize otherwise we cannot reach the scale and that subsidy again can come from uh, development financial institutions so again I would say to sum up I think three roles that uh, development financial can play catalyze first loss catalyzing uh, a large amount of private capital 
technical assistance to transform and potential subsidy to reduce the cost of funds. Luca, thank you. A, a key message I took there is the potential for scale. You, you mentioned your 300 million dollar euro fund um, catalyzed with 35 million in concessional finance. And how that can also contribute to be passed on to more accessible rates at the end of the day for the end targets, the end clients, if you will, the end beneficiaries, um, or our front lines in the war against climate change, smallholder farmers, micro, small, medium enterprises. Thank you very much. So scale. Now we're going to turn to real scale. BNP Paribas. Laurence, we are delighted you're with us. Merci pour nous joindre. We are um, excited at the Jeff about our growing collaboration in various areas, including certification, including with the Just Institute. We hope you'll um, uh, reference that for us. Uh, Laurence, please, we, we um, appreciate that BNP Paribas is such a, a champion of inclusive finance. Please tell us what this means to BNP Paribas and why it's important to BNP Paribas. Over to you, Laurence. Test, test, test. I'm also gone out of power. Hey, 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 hey. Are we going to turn the room around? We need to continue somehow. But it's, it's all to the 
Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. 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 Test, test, test. Test, test. Test, test, test. Test, test. Test, 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 test. Maybe, maybe. Our fingers, is it working? Yes, it's not louder. Is it working? Yes? Yeah, but louder. Okay, I have to speak loud. Okay, so um, so sorry for the interruption. We run for technical issues, as you may have seen. So what's in uh, inclusivity and climate and uh, biodiversity protection for BNP Paribas? Yes, well, it's our main priorities from a sustainability standpoint. So social and financial inclusion. We've been active in the microfinance field for more than 30 years financing microfinance institutions. So we have close to 3 million indirect beneficiaries, so the micro borrowers, and we've granted 1.2 billion euros. So we've grown some expertise and some legitimacy in this field. On the other hand, climate adaptation and mitigation and protection of biodiversity are our main priorities on the environmental side. So what we strive to do is to tackle all three issues at the same time and to include climate and biodiversity related criteria in the loans we provide to our, our, all our customers, so be it the big corporates or the microfinance institutions. So what we aim to do with, I can't speak loud, I'm afraid. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's better. <laughs> I feel like a rock star, you know. <laughs> so why not create a win-win-win situation in which uh, the uh, smallholders, farmers, which are at the very end of the value chain and are the most vulnerable people, get trained to implement more resilient practices, such as crop rotation, agroforestry, use of organ fertilizers, and they become more resilient and in, in a better position to reimburse their loans. The microfinance institutions, they get some comfort because the micro borrowers are more resilient. So they are in a position to attract funders because they improve their risk profile. And the funders, like BNP Paribas or other, other banks, uh, they have less risky counterparts and also they tackle three issues at the same time. So that's the goal, but in order to do so, we need to rely on tools, data, common agreed methodologies, in order to get some transparency and to know precisely what we finance, what's behind the loans we grant to microfinance institutions. So that's why we turn to uh, experts, because we are only bankers, so we can't create such a framework, and we turn to uh, IFAD for example, for support. And once we have this process, tools, methodologies, reporting process, we can go for the next step, which is a certification standard. And once the certification standard exists, it will allow microfinance institutions to know what share of their portfolio is nature-based solutions certified. And for us, funders, 
if we commit to uh, grow this share, to increase the share in their portfolio, we can imagine loans with a lower interest rate based on the achievement of an increase of the share of their portfolio, which is nature-based certified. So that's a virtual circle we want to create with this certification scheme. Laurence, thank you. Um, and thank you for your patience with the technical issues. I think we'll be able to continue this way. Laurence, a key message that I've taken is from, from, from what you said is the virtuous circle. Creating the virtuous circle using a certification scheme based on robust indicators that are commonly shared across the sector. So we're ensuring green adaptation and resilience impact from the investment made by blended and public, uh, by uh, blended public and private capital. With this, it's now my pleasure to turn to you, Jenny Ryu. Jenny Ryu is with IFAD. IFAD is a, another key partner of the Jeff, a Jeff agency and implement agency, who is working on a growing, modest but growing portfolio of, of projects of investments in the field of green, inclusive resilient microfinance. Jenny, please um, tell us about uh, IFAD's thinking about this strategy, what potential you see, um, and, and where we need to go next. I'm going to walk over to you with the microphone. Thank you very much, Jason, and everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Is that good? Yeah? Okay. Excellent. Um, yes, uh, just to say, yeah, for, I mean, at IFAD, right, our core mandate is really working with small-scale farmers. So that's what we've been doing since the beginning. Uh, we are uh, a provider of inclusive rural finance, but in the last decades, we've worked more and more on making sure that rural finance was for climate change adaptation, for lowering emission. Uh, so that's a, a newer branch of inclusive rural finance that we've, um, we're working on, and we're really excited to collaborate with the Jeff and with the partner here. I'm very sorry, is that okay? Okay, great. Um, so I mean, we know more has to be done. No? Even currently, there's only 10% uh, of rural communities that have access to formal financial services. Uh, but as we mentioned, it's not only access, no? it's also uh, making sure that, uh, that that rural financing will be uh, for this urgent need of adaptation that small-scale farmers and rural communities are facing. Um, and that's really where uh, we want to uh, go to support a rural transition that is sustainable, that is resilient um, for the small-scale farmers. At IFA, targeting is really uh, a critical aspect. So we do make sure that well, we, we really target the most vulnerable. So that also requires knowledge of the area, um, making sure we want also to support you know, farmer organization, women groups, youth. So we have also a lot of programs on uh, youth uh, entrepreneurships and we want to connect uh, that to inclusive rural financing for uh, climate adaptation. So this targeting part, you know, a lot of people say, you know, small scale farmers, I mean, the vulnerable, but who are they really? And making sure they access that inclusive um, uh, rural financing for adaptation. Um, you know, we know small-scale farmers produce one-third of the food. They're critical foods, you know, so targeting them is essential, and that's really where we have a lot of knowledge and, and working with them. And um, there's a lot of challenge even just in rural development, no? what IFAD has been doing since ever. Uh, but now we're adding also the aspects of adaptation, considering climate risk, I mean, new technology. So that's, that does require quite a lot of, of, of support also after, you know, not just accessing the financing. And that's what we're also um, really want to, to connect that rural finance uh, for adaptation with also these youth group uh, incubator, these women, you know, so that, uh, that really um, is sustainable. One more point that I'd like to mention is, is the impact. It was, you know, mentioned as extremely important the um, having a way, no, a transparent way, a traceability to show that actually these um, these uh, concessional micro, you know, uh, loans are actually bringing this impact, and that's also an area where at IFAD we've been uh, dedicating a lot of efforts 
to do impact assessment to really demonstrate that the activities that are you know having uh, or supposed to to be uh, fostering adaptation and resilience are actually bringing that and we've learned a lot from that because it's not always straightforward <laughs> so there's a lot to uh, to learn and and that's something also where uh, for more financing to be uh, to be flowing into that direction, uh, showing the benefits, the impacts, and uh, be able to certify to confirm uh, that this financing is actually used for that is it's critical, and we're also uh, working in that in that direction. So I think yes, we are extremely pleased to work with the Jeff on these three um, smaller projects, but very innovative, and we hope to scale that up also in our portfolio. Uh, we have some inclusive green financing activities also with the GCF, um, uh, but these um, which, which kind of work with the public agricultural development banks and countries where we are leading a coalition also of... Uh, One, two. Yes, it's, yeah, it's back. Okay. Um, sorry, I lost my thought, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, so we are leading this uh, public development bank coalition for, uh, for resilience, so that's another area where we see that we could scale up impacts to, um, to the agricultural public development bank. So yeah, we're really uh, looking for work with all the partners. Thank you. Merci bien, Jenny. And um, this, we're, we're really pleased about the growing um, area of work together in the Jeff partnership with EFAD in particular on microfinance. And uh, we have. Remy Rue, who is the CEO of AF16 and, and of the okay. finance in Here we go. Movement. One of the key messages I heard of is the, the one of the powerful elements um, of microfinance as a strategy Gonzalez, for resilience is the, is the ability of microfinance institutions, our partners, the frontline service deliverers, to get often where the state well doesn't even go. There are microfinance I rural agents, battalions of agents who go then out Henry on bicycles sometimes, even on, on, on in, in suite of other to vehicles to, to reach um, and then we'll the, the with the really vulnerable clients, especially in the rural sector. Uh, if It's a shame we don't have with us uh, Kunal from Cropin, who uh, again couldn't come at the last moment, he was still trying to get here yesterday, because he would have spoken, I believe, about the ability of digitized information to be able to be delivered to farmers, to smallholder farmers, in accessible, accessible forms. Um, print materials, local languages, digital forms, smartphones, series of technologies in usable forms by our front lines, indigenous peoples, local communities, women groups, youth that are relevant for youth, entrepreneurs, um, and the transfer of that information. Missing element in the panel, uh, Kunal, we're, we're glad you're with us virtually. Okay, I think we have time to go around a little bit more. I'd like to come back to you, Luca, please. Go a little bit deeper on um, the guarantees, the blending, H how does this work? Can you give us an example? What sort of scale can we aspire to? So uh, I think it's important to be specific, otherwise this concept of first loss might just remain very theoretical when it's not. Uh, theoretical is actually a really uh, financial concept. So how does it work? Uh, if, I mean, uh, basically, uh, you have two kinds of investors uh, when you have uh, a first loss and uh, uh, there are two different share classes in a fund. So have, uh, investors put money and have different rights on the way that uh, they are going to receive distribution, they're going to receive their money back. There are different priorities. So uh, uh, what's happening is that uh, if you are a, a first law, if, you, if you're a DFI and you decide to be catalytic and help uh, getting in 
catalyzing uh, private capital, uh, then what you do, you basically take more risk. Uh, so if things don't go well, you will lose money, but the private sector will not. If everything goes well, everybody will make the same kind of uh, uh, return. So once the portfolio in a fund, for example, is built and the money start comes in, gets back to the fund, first it goes to the uh, private investors until the private investors uh, actually uh, get a certain minimum return. In the case of uh, Quali, this fund we're launching is 4%. Uh, once the private sector got at least the 4%, then distributions start go to the uh, uh, development financial institutions, the catalytic capital providers, until they also get a 4%, and then uh, it's pari passu from them. This is the example that we have. But you can be very creative in the way. The key cons is about really the catalytic capital taking out risk or adding uh, returns so that that can really help uh, private investors. The scale is huge, uh, Jason. I mean, it can really, um, uh, I think if we want to reach the 100 billion uh, target commitment, uh, blended finance must be part of the picture because it's very powerful. To give you an idea, as I mentioned, we, we raised a fund which is exactly the same structure back in 2019 with 10 million euro of first laws from the European Commission, we managed to raise 90 million euros uh, of capital from the private sector, from large institutional investors such as Allianz, such as Caixa Bank, which is the largest bank in Spain, and other large family office, very quickly, uh, because it can really help taking off that little bit of perceived risk of the table and making them writing uh, faster and potentially also uh, uh, larger tickets. So I think the potential is huge. Thank you very much. If we're going to achieve the 90 mil billion target, these are the sorts of strategies I would suggest are needed. And by the way, the UNEP gap adaptation report just came out uh, six days ago now and is articulating by 2050 a gap of up to about $550 billion a year. How do, how do we get there? How do we get there? How can we blend our finance, use our strengths collectively to get to the results? And, and this is why I'm, I'm very happy to come back to you, Laurence, please. Um, and the, the BNP Paribas has championed the creation of a new institute called the Just Institute for Climate and Biodiversity uh, Inclusive Finance. Please tell us why. By the way, the Jeff is delighted to be part of this initiative. The Jeff CEO and chair person, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, is delighted to be a board member together with BP, BNP Paribas. Please, Laurence, tell us about the institute. Yes, uh, that's uh, the, the big news of the day is the launch of the Just Institute, I, as you were mentioning. So what's the, what's the Just Institute for? Um, well, we're very uh, happy to have this uh, certification program uh, financed by the GEF and the program-based approach are always great because they, they spur innovation but sometimes we've seen uh, very promising programs stopping uh, because of lack of funding so that's uh, the thing we want to avoid and we wanted to create something permanent a permanent entity so that's just institute second is we think that uh, other financial institutions share the same concerns and same ambitions as ours and we want to pool resources. So the Just Institute will also be able to um, partner with uh, additional uh, corporate financial institutions and to uh, attract additional resources. And uh, what's the most important is that it will uh, help tackling the barriers to uh, include um, climate and biodiversity criteria in inclusive finance, which are the lack of transparency. We already spoke about it. So the Just Institute will provide certification services, the lack of capacity, and it will provide training, and the lack of adapted financial products and services. I already uh, mentioned uh, low interest rates for loans, uh, which are uh, based on an increase of the share of nature-based solutions in the portfolio, but we can also imagine dedicated loans, adaptation loans for microborrowers, as you were mentioning. So there are plenty of things to be done, and the Just Institute is here uh, to scale up the initiative and to create a bridge between uh, inclusive finance and conventional finance, because we are starting with the uh, inclusive finance, 
the end of the value chain, but the ambition is to climb up the value chain and to attract other players such as SMEs, traders, wholesalers, retailers, and big corporates active in the agriculture sector who are also faced to the same situation, the decrease of the yields and the lack of resilience of our supply chain. So that's why we're very happy to announce the Just Institute. Thank you very much. Because as we move together as a community, as, with, and a reasonably diverse community in the area of inclusive finance, including, including as a component, resilience, microfinance, we need uh, brokers that work across uh, to create the consortiums, to create the networks and, and, and the movement, if, I, if we can call it that, the movement of inclusive finance for climate adaptation and resilience results locally. And by the way, if I may add, uh, we're not going to uh, make big money out of the Just Institute. It's going to be a social business, a not-for-profit, so it will sell products and services and it has to be economically viable, but it's going to be not going to be another business for BNP Paribas. And that's, and that's the need for it, because each actor has their own core business. Uh, having a, a group that can work across on a not-for-profit basis to bring us together is helpful. Um, Jenny, we'd like to come back to you, please. Um, and the sound seems to be working more fluid now, uh, fingers crossed. Jenny, please tell us a little bit more about IFAD's thinking, about the opportunities to continue to deepen, deepen, let's say, our work in this area. Thank you, Jason. Uh, it's really interesting also to hear from the, uh, the other speaker, and I hope we will uh, have the chance to collaborate more, even in, in the context of the Jeff. Um, so as you've mentioned, yeah, we're a Jeff uh, implementing agency. So I think in that sense, uh, we will, um, and with Jeff's new strategy, having more focus on private sector for adaptation, I think we would be uh, really delighted to work with uh, private sector partners to, um, to do more together in that space. Um, so IFAD strategy uh, on inclusive rural financing and specifically for adaptation. So most of our climate, like 40% of our portfolio is climate. And of that, 90% 90 is, is adaptation. So that's really something we are going big. And what we do differently or what we want to focus is really more looking at the needs of the beneficiaries first. So we do also market studies, uh, looking with you know, value chain actors, uh, with the small scale producer, and uh, trying to see really what could be the, the demand for financial products. I mean, what would they be ready to um, to borrow for. And we've expanded also our work more with, uh, with other, uh, with private sector, you know, fintech, impact investor, um, and as I mentioned, agricultural development banks. So those are also other actors who are trying to uh, enlarge our, our work. Um, and, and that's, yeah, that's a major line of work, no? because most of the three, four billion of IFAD investments, 40% of that is for climate, and 90% we're focusing on, on adaptation. Um, so I think there uh, would be, yeah, I think we're, we, it, we've also, um, two years ago, I think, we have a, a private sector strategy that was approved by our board. And now we've started also to work directly also with, uh, you know, open a line of non-sovereign operation. So that's also an area where we're uh, opening for, you know, usually we work through countries, government, but we have also now a new line of work on directly financing private sector. Um, so that's another, uh, but... We, we see it as co-investor, no? so uh, going back to the blended finance, that's how really how we see it. So we have, um, we have the IFAD investment, we're looking at working with the private sector and, and blending, and we're, we're ready to, yeah, to be catalytic, to take risks, to, uh, to make sure we, we target the most vulnerable and bring them in, no? and, and this space. Um, last point maybe to mention, yeah, it's important that what we do connect back or align with also the national level strategies, plan, and we're also supporting governments and that, uh, and, you know, revising their NDC and, and, and reflecting more uh, of these maybe new potential, new opportunities. So that's another important area that we need to, uh, to think about when doing this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Lots of potential is the key message I'm taking there. So we would now like to open up the floor, have a discussion. Uh, thank you to those who are with us. Please, the microphone, don't speak too soon, seem to be working. Um, please, colleagues, uh, share your reflections, your insights, any questions for the panelists.
Uh, please, sir. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for the panel. It was quite insightful. Uh, my name is Bashar. I go to the University of British Columbia. Uh, I'm originally from Bangladesh, so I have seen a lot of this microfinance uh, work play out. So I, uh, last December, I went to Hathajari, where Professor Yunus started his initiative to speak with some of the like, loan providers. And what I realized that in many cases, what happens is these are people who are very like underprivileged, right? So when they receive a loan, the first thing they do is they meet their basic needs. So they buy food or they buy a refrigerator. That essentially means they have a higher quality of life after receiving that loan. However, since they're spending the money on buying a fridge instead of buying a cow, what happens is there's no return. So my question to you folks is, um, is there a way to design these loans where people are able to meet their basic needs first? Because, you know, at, like, if you're trying to target the ultra poor, but like Bangladesh is fairly still, like, there are many organizations, um, microfinance institutions that work in the ground, and sometimes they're very brutal. Um, they want their payments back, and, and in some cases there has been extreme instances as well. Uh, so how can we deal with that? Uh, I know we are talking about economies of scale, you're talking broader picture, but like, I, I want to understand like, how, as people, like, as, as the positions you hold, how do you address that issue? Thank you. No. I, I'd, I'd like to uh, delve a little bit on this point, because I think this is a key point. Thank you so much for that question, very grounding. Um, Christoph, you used the term at the very beginning, loan shark based yeah, access they, they with exorbitant interest rates. Over 100% often. I've heard of 300% interest rates. Uh, driving people further into debt. This is what we're trying to avoid at scale. Please tell us how, how through these sorts of public private partnerships, we can make interest rates and terms as um, payback uh, times, as accessible as possible, and have a sustainable model of capital, capital availability. Please, um, anyone, uh, maybe a, 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 especially Luca and, and Christoph, I, I see your eyes raising. Yes, uh, so one first important distinction, uh, important point. Microfinance is not a tool for ultra poor people. Uh, so that's very key. Microfinance is a tool for people that already have an activity that needs, that can be farming activity, can be a small shop, can be like, uh, but so that, so that the money can be used, has to be used for productive activity. If uh, a poor person gets a loan and use it to buy food because that's what it, that's that has been that's not the right tool. I mean that that is rather emergency or really other kind of grant based assistance. Microfinance is not done for ultra poor people. This is the first thing I wanted to say. Um, and, and and the second thing, if you want to drive the cost down, uh, um, I think there is one. Uh, uh, there there are a couple of uh, leverages, uh, but the key one, and then I pass the I pass it to to uh, to Christophe, uh, is technology. I mean, uh, if you think about the cost of uh, think about uh, uh, Bangladesh, I, uh, think about India, for example, which is next to you. I don't know, I don't know how the interest rates are built in Bangladesh. India uh, interest rates are about. Um, 20, 25%, depending on the institution, the, the, a large chunk of that, uh, it is uh, operating cost. It's just very expensive to have a loan officer that takes uh, on a monthly basis, goes at the house, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that, 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 that's really, technology can play a major role. Uh, Christoph, I think you can uh, probably add uh, quite a bit to that. Now you said it all, actually, so <laughs> good. No, but, but, but I would also like to reinforce that statement. So first of all, I said in the beginning, microfinance is commercial finance. It's reimbursable finance. It's not grants. Yeah, that's not microfinance. It's not subsidy. Well, we have subsidized um, models like blended and catalytic finance. And um, so that's, that's the first. If they buy food, this is not what you should be doing with a loan. 
yeah you should earn money you should generate revenues and the second one yeah and then then that's actually it um, uh, it's technology you need to you need to have proper financial analysis and you can you have can you can have scorings even for excluded people you can have um, scorings which help you to understand what the payment capacity is what the income level is etc um, and I would like to bring it back there again um, to the adaptation and resilience finance and looking more maybe we have talked a lot about financing, um, blended finance, about the funder's perspective. But let's also look at um, the perspective of the most vulnerable, of the people that really need it. They need to be at a level where they are surpassing the subsistence level. Yeah, And then what we are looking for is productive finance where we invest into um, resilience, revenue, adaptation, enhancing activities. So which increase their livelihoods, Yeah, enhance their livelihoods. So, um, it cannot be these consumption items. Yeah, there we need different approaches. Um, so, in technology, I think can play a great role. You can work much much more with data. Yeah, you can of course for climate risks that's rather straightforward, honestly. But also for other topics like socio-economic resilience. Um, in that sense, um, I need to check on this and I need to select better. Um, okay, but I want to come back to others as well. Just very quickly, um, the good thing about uh, uh, invest. So let's make a very very simple example. Um, uh, if I am a microfinance institution, I would rather invest in a farmer that has a water management system in place because I know that this farmer he will be able to pay me back even if there is a drought because he's more resilient than not. And if I know that the probability th this person is going to pay me back, I can reduce the interest rate. I can actually get a much lower. So a more resilient farmer, a farmer that uh, uh, got uh, uh, installed, for example, a world management system is a risk less risky client, and I can give him loans at a lower interest rate. Just wanted to make this point. So, so what we're talking about here is getting, helping that farmer get a water management system at accessible rates. Um, I think an important point here is that microfinance, nobody's saying microfinance is a solution for everything. It's not a panacea. Nothing is a panacea. There's uh, for um, other most for emergency situations, most poor of the poor who don't have a produ uh, productive activity that could have a return, other strategies are needed to be deployed. We've heard about technology, reducing um, cost, uh, meaning reducing interest rates and terms, um, time to pay back. Technology is a way to get rates down. And another way is the, the, the blending of finance. Concessional finance can then be passed, because that de-risk can then be passed on to the end beneficiary, smallholder farmers, microenterprises. Okay, I wanna, I'm going speaking quick because I want to make sure we get a couple of more comments in. Ma'am. Um, thank you very much. My name is Pauline. I'm from Uganda, and we work with smallholder farmers accessing financing. And I am greatly appreciate the taxonomy because it, it really helps with, with the targeting, making sure that the resilience and adaptation bit is catered for. Because many a times when you target microfinance, things evolve and at the end of the day you can't quite recognize the objectives for what uh, they were created for. But also, um, Jenny, the concept of targeting really speaks to where we are coming from because when you look at the targeting you realize that uh, the needs kind of work for for what what you've talked about and what you've talked about because really these smallholder farmers they have a business but it just hasn't yet reached that level of maturity to, to 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 access the financing so i'm wondering do you have some innovations that are targeting that level of de-risking being able to, to, to bring it, to, 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 to recognize it as a business and be able to access the financing. And I would give an example of the organization I work with. We support the smallholder farmers to use the business and so on and so forth. Then they access climate finance or carbon payments. So it is the carbon payments that are used to create a credit history and then they use the payment for environmental services that we have as collateral for loans and so on and so forth. That way, when they finally access the microfinance, they will use it for the business as opposed to using it for... So I'm wondering whether in the partnerships that you're building, because 
this level of hand holding the farmers, incubating them to even get to the level that you need them, is, is also a special um, uh, service that probably can only be done by civil society organizations and, and using even a, a, a bilateral and multilateral funding. So I'm wondering whether in the partnerships that you're building, you also have a role for such um, actors or players. Thank you. Another very important and grounding point, um, and the role of um, technical assistance, if we can call it that, the direct outreach with the farmers, with the end clients, for um, understandable, implementable solutions. What are the menu of options? Um, I'd like to come back to the panel on that. Please keep that in mind. We also have, there are a number of hands, and I'm conscious of time, so I'd like to take three, quest, uh, three comments or questions now. Um, and then let's please uh, respond to each of them. Um, we'll next go to Alois of Unido, uh, and then Manuel of APT, and then I hope we'll have time to go to others um, in turn. Thank you very much. Alois, please. Thank you, Jason, and um, very fascinating panel. Um, Christoph, you give us the what, and I think one of the points that you mentioned is uh, challenges around um, the capacity, the global standards, uh, transparency, and all this. Look, uh, we are going to 100 millions, and I, I like what is, uh, Just Institute is doing. My colleague from IFA did a lot of uh, work on the ground, and just on the challenge program. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at this and saying there's really um, a lot of learning and knowledge sharing that could actually bring this to scale. Uh, what can be done so that there's more learning? I, I also learned from what she's doing in Uganda. So, and so that I mean, this le these lessons are available to the broader public and microfinance can actually be then unrolled at scale that actually have the level of transformation that we require for, for adaptation, for us to be able to respond to adaptation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, very briefly, I'd love to hear from the panelists about the risks involved for MFIs in adopting many of these innovations, right? I, I, I think, you know, what in many ways what I'm hearing is about the evolution of the business model of MFIs, the stretching of the role of MFIs. There's a list of potential innovations, a list of potential solutions that we've talked about here, but at the same time, I think, Jesus, like, there's a core of the business of MFIs that is still there, which is giving out loans, getting the money back, operational efficiencies, all that stuff. And now we're adding all these things on top. And in my mind, I, were, I wonder whether we're asking too much from MFIs by asking them to add all these activities, which in many cases, like maybe they're just not good enough to pick up all six things and they need to do better technical assistance. And that's that. And maybe insure tech solutions to get closer to the customer, and that's that, right? So um, I'd, I'd love to hear more about your experiences in um, helping MFIs stretch and evolve their business model and managing the risks of, hey, by asking them too much, maybe we're hurting the MFI. And we need to be mindful and realistic of what they can take on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Zodi from Cambodia. I, I work for uh, Agricultural and Rural Development Bank, a uh, policy bank of Cambodia. So I would like to ask uh, one question in short because we have a lack of time. I, you know, in terms of uh, uh, security, because you know, uh, for farmer, uh, smallholder farmers, uh, uh, they actually lack of great role. So in terms of uh, uh, securitization for the loan, it is very hard for smallholder farmers. So in terms of um, uh, capitalizing inclusive microfinance, it means that uh, some kind of mechanism to access to finance. For Cambodian people, you know, uh, they really have a lack of uh, collateral. So, uh, so how can we access to, uh, uh, I mean, a smallholder farmer can access to finance without collateral, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, securities. Because in Cambodia, we cannot, uh, in terms of government policy, 
uh, there is no subsidy. So as a bank or microfinance, they really uh, need the collateral to secure the loan. So, in, uh, so how can a Jeff or IFAT uh, or agency can create uh, an enable uh, environment like a mechanism to, to de-risk in terms of collateral or clean loan or something like that? So just short question, I think that you can catch my question. Thank you, thank you. Jilip Sua. Very good, very good question. So we have excellent questions. We have a few minutes left. I'd like to ask the panelists to uh, respond uh, very briefly, um, if, if you're inclined, and then we'll come back to Christoph, who started us off with some reflections. Um, thank you. For, uh, just a quick reiteration, Uganda, grounding us on what about the training and the tools and civil society organizations involved in that, in the ecosystem of microfinance? Please, someone reflect on that. Um, you need to oh, thank you for your inputs. We're very glad you're with us. We have a lot of learning and knowledge sharing to do. A number of the projects we're talk talking about are supported through the Jeff Challenge Program for Adaptation Innovation, a, a program I have the pleasure to manage. We have opportunities for advancing the learning and the, 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 the good practices through that. Um, Manuel of APT, are we asking too much of MFIs? Are we being too ambitious? Are we being too ambitious? The, this, okay. Cambodia, thank you, sir, from Cambodia, thank you. Um, uh, what about uh, collateral issues? I, 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 how, how can we navigate that the, the most effectively possible to get support to those who need it, to get capital resources to those who need it? Please, colleagues, nod if you'd like the microphone. Thank you, Jason, and thank you for the very good question. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, respond a little bit to the question from Uganda. Um, definitely, yeah, that's something like if it doesn't only have rural finance activities, now we have also uh, our programs of loan and grants that support governments. Uh, so it will, the governments will take up the loans uh, or receive the grants, but down and the communities, uh, activities will be implemented as, as grant, no? So that's how we support also small-scale farmers, farmers' organization, women groups to, to get better, no? So that, and often uh, a bit of an exit strategy will be to connect them with these microfinancing. Once they, you know, once they've developed a little bit more their productive activities or connected through the value chain, also when we've strengthened entrepreneurship and value chain actors, you know, build market, then will make sure that uh, we'll connect them to, micro, you know, to inclusive microfinance. So that's maybe the next IFA investments would include a branch of inclusive microfinance. And then more and more, because of the need for adaptation, we, you know, we, we mainstream it as, a, as one of our um, um, you know, important uh, mainstreaming teams. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a bit how we work. So it, it responds a bit to, to your question and um, yeah, just maybe a little bit to touch upon that, but I think uh, the other, um, speaker can, can expand more. But just, yeah, at IFAD, we've done a lot of work on uh, assessing the portfolio of, uh, of local, you know, national uh, financial institution that were work. And sometimes they do finance activities that could qualify as adaptation. Uh, but they don't know, uh, they don't, you know, maybe there's not the right uh, support associated with that. So, uh, so that's something which I think that, and it's open up opportunities for them, like it was also mentioned. So I think it's, and, and that's the future. So yes, <laughs> we all have to step up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, also on the same topic, uh, are we asking too much uh, of microfinance on, on top of everything? I don't think it's on top of everything. It's going to be core uh, because uh, we provide with a certification scheme and then the Just Institute will provide some solutions. We provide a, a framework, a, a methodology. Uh, funders already ask microfinance to demonstrate their social performance, and they're going to ask for uh, resilience performance and uh, climate performance as well. So it's a, a way to, for microfinance to improve their credit uh, profile and to attract funders. So I think it's, a, it's something they have to get used to. And uh, of course, we totally acknowledge the additional uh, workload. That's why we offer, we will offer low interest rates to compensate for the workload. And of course, we hope for microfinance 
to offer low interest rate to the end user, to the micro borrowers. Um, there are two things that we can, and so answering, uh, uh, well, first of all, I think on very briefly, on the, on the scaling up, uh, I think we lay out the foundation, the models uh, through which we can scale up. We rely, we know, we, we, now we have blended finance, uh, we have a number of uh, uh, case studies, so to say, it works, it can work. Private uh, uh, investors are increasingly aware of it and are asking for it. Uh, including large institutional investors, it's just a matter of scaling up what we have already. So my ask would be two things. More catalytic capital, uh, that, that will be absolutely key. And again, it depends on country and riskiness, but we can leverage the catalytic capital one to five, one to 10, potentially one to 20. So that I think it can be very powerful. And the second ask, which I know might be a little bit difficult, Accessing the catalytic capital is sometimes a bit cumbersome. Uh, it just takes uh, it just takes time, uh, and and so which is uh, it's public money. It's normal. It has to go through a number of processes. Uh, absolutely, but but if we can find ways to streamline a little bit those uh, those uh, those processes, it would be very helpful. And if we scale up quickly, and I'll be quick. Just I will just add something on the, on about the microfinance uh, institutions. There are two things we can ask microfinance institutions. We're asking microfinance institutions to do. The first one is about getting, answering, meeting their clients' needs. So we asked microfinance institutions to launch products that answer client needs. This is a good thing for the microfinance institution. They have to do it if they want to survive. And if they want to do what they have to do, which is so as any good financial institutions, they have to do it, and I think that's not a huge effort. They, it's, it's the opposite. We are a development community. We're helping them evolving in a way that there will be better institutions. In some cases, it's true, where we can ask microfinance institutions also to do a little bit more. For example, because, w but that, that's not necessary. For example, uh, uh, um, uh, talking about climate adaptation, we're asking them, for example, to start installing water management. Again, going back to the example, water se selling, distributing water management solutions to farmers. We might ask microfinance institutions to educate a little bit the client about that. So the loan officer will need to know a little bit about it. We'll need to know a little bit about uh, greenhouses, for example. Uh, and, and that's, yeah, there has to be a little bit of an effort, uh, but I think we can do it. And as a development inst uh, financial institutions, as development community, we need to help them doing that thing. And we can go to a step further that uh, that's tough. Can it's cut, to, sorry. yeah, I'll cut, I'll cut. <laughs> okay, now, 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 now I'm afraid. Yeah, <laughs> I will speed up. Um, Jason asked me also to do a bit of a wrap up. Um, I, I, I think what we heard is a lot of around catalytic finance, blended finance, around the financial structures we have behind um, to channel them actually for resilience, for adaptation to the most vulnerable. So job well done. I think we have the certification. We, 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 we talked, we touched upon taxonomies. I think um, what, what now Luca and also Jamie said before is, um, well, let's look at, um, at, at the final beneficiaries. No? So, um, and I think what is very important and probably for at least for me the basis for this panel and also for responding to the, to the, to the questions um, and the comments is, um, well, we know that climate change will impact us and we know that it will impact disproportionately the most vulnerable. So we know this already. It's, a, it's not a question of maybe or maybe not. Yeah? So we need to adjust to it. Meaning, um, yeah, is it a stretch for, 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 for microfinance institutions? Yes, there is a competition to traditional loan-pushing products, yeah, which should not be done, but they're happening, and it's, 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 every industry has their, their, their bad sheeps also. Uh, so, yes, there is a competition, and we need to overcome that. But we also know that whoever is not addressing it will have a problem in the future. How can we scale it? Well, we need to work together on it. We need taxonomies to align it. So if everybody is talking within the country's context on the same investment targets based on shared taxonomies, well, then we are all working towards the same goal. So we can scale it up. And we can come to the, to, to the situation that, well, we have different responsibilities. Yeah? It's not that um, microfinance will do all. 
Yeah. So we have a couple of people, a um, couple of segments of the population of the most vulnerable. They don't need mm, uh, reimbursable finance. They need subsidies. They need training. They need capacity building. Yeah. They need these civil societies that support them in creating the capacities so that they become subjects for reimbursable finance. Yeah. So and then, then I think uh, for the collateral question and just um, all based on this, that this is coming, microfinance is pretty accustomed and adapt to work without collateral. Yeah? So there are different loan um, uh, and, and, and product uh, design topics you can implement in order to avoid that. And then you have IFAT um, uh, and, and other development institutions that can support it with portfolio guarantees, with different types of um, guarantee setups um, where you can build upon. But I think most important is climate change is happening. The most vulnerable are disproportionately um, affected. There are solutions, um, and we all need to work together in order to get there. So um, I hope that was what you wanted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great uh, summary and further reflections. And thank you for bringing in this ingredient. Um, it's more than an ingredient. It's, it's fundamental of civil society partners, training partners, which is a key ingredient in the ecosystem of microfinance, delivering the support to the end beneficiaries in approaches to and solutions to, which ultimately seek microfinance, uh, biodigesters, uh, drip irrigation systems, the sort of, how, how to do them in local uh, context relevant situations, which is the beauty of, my, one of the beauties of microfinance, that it can get to very local contexts effectively. I'm going to say thank yous. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you to this panel, Luca, Laurence, Jani, Christophe, Canal, you are with us. We wish you were in body, but thank you for being with us virtually. Um, thank you very much, especially to the colleagues from Bangladesh, UBC, Uganda, UNIDO, Manuel Apt, uh, Cambodia, Jiriplia. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, conversation. We look forward to continuing it. We will continue this afternoon with another Jeff event, similar, similar, but a little bit different, talking about private fu investment funds, investment facilities for climate adaptation impact. What they look like, what are the, what are the good ingredients? What are the key ingredients? How they can drive to very local impact? Uh, that'll be at 3.30 this afternoon. Again, thank you very much.